To understand the Knights now, it's essential to know when and where and why they began, in Belfast in 1915, as an offshoot of the local conference of St. Vincent de Paul. They dedicated themselves to fighting socialism and at the same time to securing a Catholic social justice for the Catholic poor. The pogroms of 1920-21 drove them from Belfast to Dublin, where they amalgamated with another order of almost the same name, the Columban Knights, whose own objects were to fight Protestant discrimination against Catholics in business and the civil service. To do this, and at the same time protect themselves from Protestant reprisals, they had to keep their membership secret. Members recognised each other by passwords and handshakes. They did good by stealth, and often Catholics they helped to secure promotion or a contract had no idea who had helped them. After 1921, the need for secrecy disappeared in the South, but the habit remained. The amalgamated orders, the Knights of St. Columbanus, with their two strands of thought to fight socialism and to end discrimination against Catholics, became a kind of Catholic masonry, immensely influential in the new Free State. These robes, each with its different badge of office, which until recently were worn by the officers at formal meetings, seemed to symbolize both the order's strength and its secrecy. It was an organized and skillful pressure group, and it came to be believed that those they smiled on did well, and those they frowned on did not. They were widely thought of as self-seeking killjoys, hatchet men of the church. If this was all a vicious lie, secrecy allowed it to flourish unanswered. And, said the wise, in fact, they still say it, if the knights have nothing to hide, why do they hide it? I'm very well aware of the certain picture conveyed of officers being uh, life haters, Jansenistic, puritanical, concerned more with banning than promoting. The fact that this is an unfair and untrue picture is one of the things that concerns me. Now, it is, I think, right to say that the body of our members are conservative. But they, they do, in that way, pretty accurately reflect the general nature uh, of public opinion amongst the laity in Ireland. They're not only conservative, they're also purely middle class, aren't they? No. Uh, I, it just would be true to say in a general way that we are mainly a middle class uh, society. But we have members from a very wide range of occupations and classes all, all over the country. I'd like to come back for a moment to the word conservative that I said a moment ago. We are conservative. So is the whole body of the church in Ireland. The times call for a change of attitude. And I, as Supreme Knight, with my board who are with me in this, are determined to come out into the open, to be seen to be what we are. Your policy in the past is supposed to have been mainly repressive. It's not, it is not in fact true that it's been repressive. Let me say, Brian, I've been a member of this society for 32 years. I became a member at the age of 20. I have now been elected Supreme Knight. As an individual, speaking on television and writing, my attitude has been pretty clearly known and understood. And it is perhaps a measure of the real um, attitude of our members that in spite of that, you might say, I have been elected Supreme Knight. Now, in regard to matters like censorship, we have, our members have been engaged in the past in this effort to see that pornography isn't spread around amongst to the damage of our young people. No uh, apology whatever for that. In the course of doing so, our uh, society in Ireland has, has perhaps thrown out too many babies with a lot of dirty bath water. This is one of the things I, that I, I want to see our, our members themselves realizing, that pure defensiveness is what we needed at one time, as, as it was needed in the church's own history, is now out of date. You're also accused of having used hidden influence. I would say this. In regard to certain activities, the knights, or perhaps rarely the, the, rarely the entire body, but a particular council or branch did act the part of a pressure group. We have pressure groups of, of all sides, of all kinds in this country. This is quite true. On the other hand, 
And, but I think that the, uh, the objects that they, that, that they wished to achieve were good. Very often, pressure has been exercised by people who are not knights. But they have, the, that kind of thing has been, as it were, attributed to us. We have been blamed for many things that we didn't do. We might well be blamed for many things that we ought to have done. These men are becoming knights. In a very simple reception ceremony, very unlike the complicated and fantastical ritual that outsiders might expect from a supposedly secret order of knighthood. Each of these men was invited to join. Nothing would have prevented them applying, except that that's unusual. The knights go looking for the men they want. Catholics who've already made some mark in the community, born leaders. They want drivers, not passengers. The new member is also expected to be of sound financial standing. He'll pay dues of five pounds to ten pounds a year, but that's only the beginning. A dozen times a year he'll be asked if he can afford to help this or that particular cause. Through confirmation, we are assigned to the apostles by Christ himself. The laity share in the priestly, prophetic, and royal office of Christ, and therefore have their own share in the mission of the whole people of God in the church and in the world. We are consecrated not only to offer spiritual sacrifice in everything we do, but also to bear witness to Christ in the activities of our daily life. There are 7,000 Knights of St. Columbanus. They're divided into 140 primary councils of about 50 members each. And these form 11 provinces. Each council has its grand knight and chaplain, usually the local parish priest, and its own officers. So has each province. And at the head of the whole organization, elected for a three-year term, is the Supreme Knight and his council. The Knight's basic income from annual dues is about £50,000 a year. And there are some investments, and various special funds like the Widows and Orphans Fund to help families of Knights who died poor. The central headquarters, Eli House, where this reception ceremony is taking place, is very valuable. The Knights bought it cheaply in the 1920s. Today, it must be worth about 130,000 pounds. And each primary council is expected to own its own headquarters, some large house in the town that can itself be a source of income as well as a capital asset. The real wealth of the Knights is their membership. If they want large sums of money for a special cause, they ask their members for it. The organization is purely Irish. There are no branches outside this country. If a knight goes abroad permanently, he'll probably resign and join some other organization in his new home. In England, it might be the Catanians or the Knights of St. Columba. In Nigeria, for example, there's an order of black knights of the Blessed Morumba. But in general, knights are likely to be men with deep roots at home and unlikely to emigrate. Brothers, the knights elect ask you to receive them as members of the councils of the order to which they are assigned. So I will now ask the chaplain to bless the emblem of knighthood with which you are to be presented. It is a copy of this penal crucifix. I have then asked the chaplain to invest you as knights. <laughs> Amen.